All right, we got a good group of people here. We are here today to talk about anomaly detection. So thank you for making it in here. You could be anywhere, you could be at the bar. It's a bit early for the bar. I'm the last thing between you and lunch. So um, anomaly detection, you know, this is an intro talk. I'm not gonna get super deep into machine learning. It doesn't really expect any previous knowledge. Um, it's meant to really introduce the concept of anomaly detection because after all, you see it everywhere, right? I was talking to some folks in the uh, vendor hall. So many products that have anomaly detection as one of the key parts of the product or the technology of the innovation. Um, and so yeah, so thank you for being here. I've, I'm Andre, I've uh, been sort of in a DevOps, DevSecOps space for my whole career, 10 plus years, was a Red Hat for many years as a consultant, traveling all over the place. Now I'm working for a startup, talking to teams of all sizes that are doing cloud native stuff, whether they built their companies on cloud native stacks, migrating critical workloads there, and seeing what's working and what's not working. And um, I've really become interested, I've been doing server hardening and, and sort of like CIS standard and DISA SIG, um, automating security, automating hardening, automating vulnerability patching and stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, it never quite got to um, that ideal place, right? Actually, you can never get to an ideal place, but it never, it was always like a Sisyphean task where you constantly patching, going back, trying to shift left and all of that to achieve security. But a lot of people that I've been talking to are still kind of struggling to, to make sense of that. So the point of this talk is that I've really started to research a lot about anomaly detection, and I decided to share a little bit of what I learned. I've been reading some of the research papers, talking to people that have anomaly detection as part of their products, and um, you know, learning a little bit, and I wanted to share with you all. Um, so a couple of things that I wanna to cover today is why anomaly detection specifically for cloud security, right? Anomaly detection has been around for a couple of decades. You've seen it in the network space, fraud detection, a lot of different areas. Uh, but how does it fit within the world of cloud security and cloud native applications? So for that, we're gonna step back really quickly and look at the history of anomaly detection for intrusion detection. Sort of why was this created? Do the reasons for which it was created still make sense in this cloud native paradigm, right? quickly look at a typical model, right? A typical anomaly detection for intrusion detection model. Um, and sort of look at the benefits, right? What does it promise to bring to the cloud security sort of arena, right? Um, and you know, no technology, no innovation is without its flaws and without its challenges, right? It's not about trying to find some sort of panacea or anything like that. We're gonna take a look at the practical challenges, right? Um, you know. If I look at the promise and all the benefits that it can bring for your company, for your organization, or for your, to your practice as an individual practitioner, um, you know, why isn't it more widespread today? Why, why hasn't it solved the problem already? So we're gonna take a look at that. Uh, there's been some challenges to the anomaly detection model as well, to the sort of anomaly detection paradigm. We're gonna quickly take a look at that and take a look at the evolution of anomaly detection. There's been a lot of advance over the past couple of years, past few years, take a some of the, look at some of the things that are making it more real than ever and, you know, really have a real world impact. So why anomaly detection for cloud security and why now, right? So why does it matter, right? Why should I care about this, right? Um, you know, cloud security is way more complicated than the sort of paradigm that we inherited from on-prem, right? If you look at the, you know, when I started as a sysadmin, as a DevOps practitioner, it was, you know, put the server here, right, Apache, LAMP servers, whatever the server may be, right, and you leave it there in a rack for a year, right, patch it, maybe, you do patch it, right, but it's going to be there, that static IP is going to be there, right, you can protect it because you understand it really well, you can harden it and it's your baby, right, handcraft it. Cloud security is way different, right? Especially cloud native applications that are being developed nowadays. The typical application is gonna be deployed as a microservice, you know, frequently 
a bunch of small little services that are running in Kubernetes, running as functions as a service. It has all kinds of funky auto-scaling happening all the time. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people are migrating to um, Kubernetes frameworks. And if you look at you know, just microservices architecture itself, there's a lot more interconnection, right? There's a, a lot more network traffic. You know, as you look at these auto-scaling situations, there's a, more, a lot more dynamic IPs. So in other words, the, it's a lot more complex to even understand what you're trying to secure, right? Things are more ephemeral and there's a larger risk surface. And you know, this is actually not a solved problem in our industry, right? Cloud security, by any means. Right, so you know, everybody here has job security assured for many, many years because, you know, like one research, a group of researchers did a, a scan over the like this year at the turn of the year, 72% uh, of the cloud configurations that they uh, scanned, 75% of the organizations had 72% uh, had flaws, right? Had misconfigurations like open S3 buckets, right? Um, security groups that quad zero, you know, world, world, re world readable, world writable stuff, right? Real problem, and this is being exploited a lot, right? Cloud environments are a massive target right now. And, um, you know, there's more and more zero day vulnerabilities, right? All the time. I mean, maybe we're discovering them, we're doing a better job of discovering them. Uh, but, you know, uh, Google's Project Zero was reporting, you know, 2021 was a record-breaking year. I'm sure, I'm not going to say I'm sure, but it, it is likely that this could be the case in 2022 as well, right? So it is critical, right? It is a critical, what we're doing as professionals is incredibly important, right? I think, you know, most people could say that their organization are all in on cloud, strongly migrating to cloud, right? And it's not a solved problem, so solutions are needed. But you may say, oh, we had solutions, right? We had signature-based tools that can protect our environments that we know and love, right? Yes, we can, right? But it's not always hitting the target, right? This is where I've been talking to a lot of teams as a consultant and as a solution architect, and they tell me, you know, it's very hard right, as an analyst, just putting my analyst hat on, right, because, you know, they'll say, I wanna protect my Kubernetes clusters, right, and then I'll have product X, Y, and Z, and they'll say, we have 400 rules, we have 500 rules, I have 2,000 rules, I win, you know, and, and it's great, you know, it's great, that they, but the problem is, you get all of those rules, right, you download the rule set, you apply against your cluster, against your environment, and this even applies to CIS standard and some other things, right? Then the app doesn't run, right? The server, the service doesn't run, right? And then what do I do? I have to go through a process of, I'm gonna suppress this rule, right? I'm gonna make sure that this rule is applied. It's a lot of work, right? And it ends up being a human being that has to decide what to suppress, what to allow, and as a security analyst, I don't necessarily fully understand the application stack or that cluster, how it was built, right? So, you know, if you tighten it too much, you, you know, you start getting a ton of false alerts, right? False positives. Very common. How many false alerts you get in a day? A hundred, right? And then people start even checking, right? Stop checking the SIEM. Of course, you don't want to do that, but it does become a problem, right? So, you know, that is, you know, hasn't really solved the problem, right? CVEs are out there, we patch the CVEs, that's great, you know, but do we always, are we, are we ever able to achieve 100%, you know, coverage within that month before the flood starts all over again, right? So that's the thing, you know, and signature-based um, security, right, is, where I have like, you know, a signature for a malware, a, a CV number assigned to that package, right, to a vulnerability that's found in a package. Um, that's all great, right, but a lot of exploits that happen in the real world, especially more complex ones that really threaten the health of the business, end up um, being zero-day attacks, right, where a signature doesn't even exist yet. That's something that happens a lot, right? And, you know, just signature alone is not solving the cloud security problem. 
So let's take a look at what anomaly detection is. And again, this is an introductory you know, talk, so if you never heard about anomaly detection, I mean, you probably heard of it, but you never really studied it, you're, you're in the right place, that's where you're gonna start. If you know a lot about it, let's talk about it and, and we can all learn together. So anomalies, right? So first of all, let's, the lingo and the jargon, right? What's anomaly detection? Well, what's an anomaly, right? So an anomaly just comes from data science, right? And I found this really decent um, description, which is basically a data point that's different from others in terms of its features, or they're rare in a data set, right? There are odd things that happen every once in a while. There are things that, behaviors and things that look different than the norm. So, you know, looking at anomalies, where did, you know, where do we start, we as an industry, cybersecurity, where did, you know, we start using these models to protect our environments, right? This is basically a lot of the credit goes to Dorothy Denning, we, it, in the late 80s, created the first sort of statistics, you know, statistical model, a complete model to create intrusion detection, an intrusion detection system based on anomaly detection. Uh, anomaly, yes, exactly. So the idea that she had was that in the hypothesis behind the whole um, research, right, and the whole commercial application of anomaly detection comes from the idea that the exploitation of a system vulnerability involves abnormal usage, right? There's a lot of logic to that, right? So think about it this way, right? If everybody is using that system the way it was architected and it was supposed to be used, we wouldn't have a problem, right? Developers will log in, develop code, commit to the repo, create an image, right? Push the image, requests will come from the outside, front end would talk to the database and everything would be copacetic, right? When things are misused, you know, and when things are malicious, you know, when nobody's programming or architecting for malicious activity, right? So if we can detect something that is outside of what that pattern should be, then there's a good chance that that could be malicious activity. And that was the basis of the model, right? There were some, I, there were some um, usage of uh, statistical anomaly detection in sort of uh, factories and in the industrial sector before. Right, you know, you're looking at um, you know airplanes or the you know uh, production line and seeing things that are outside of that statistical model, like that curve, right? But uh, Dorothy Denon was the first one that created a full model that kind of put that all together in what could, actually ended up being created um, intrusion detection systems that protected very critical national systems for many, many, many years, and is the basis of everything else that's come after that. So the cool thing about this model that she created was that it doesn't necessarily apply to any specific system or application, right? It's a conceptual model, and it's a way that you can reuse into a lot of things, right? And, and that's actually something that's really powerful to where we are today. We're gonna get that in a second, right? The, the, how um, flexible this model is, right? That's something that can really benefit our industry um, as we go. And one of the things that has been there from the beginning as you're thinking about anomaly detection is that it's an extra layer of protection, right? I'm not here saying like, let's stop doing signature-based detection. Absolutely not, right? That's a must have, right? We still need to um, pursue those vulnerabilities. We still need to harden our systems. We still need to adopt all of those best practices, but this will be an additional layer that is very, very important. Why, why is it very, very important? We talked a little bit about it, right? But one of the things that I wanted to bring to this talk today was the idea that she had some original motivations to create anomaly detection, uh, uh, anomaly detection for intrusion detection. And I wanted to take a look at, do these still apply to cloud security, to cloud native security, right? Like maybe this model is outdated, right? It doesn't really make sense for our industry anymore. I think that it does, right? So if we look at it, the motivation around it was that in the beginning, it was almost impossible, you know, she believed that it was very difficult, right, to find and fix all of these deficiencies for technical and economic reasons. Is that still true today? Absolutely, right? If you go to the commercial sector and you talk to customers, they are constantly in that hamster wheel of addressing vulnerabilities, 
You know, it's almost, you know, then people are like, I need vulnerability automation, right? You know, and yes, that's great. We can do Ansible, we can do all of those things. But the thing is that that's costly, right? I'm actually spending all that time working on that stuff, fixing those flaws and not working on other activity. And guess what? I create a secure image. Now my developers say, yeah, you know, like we can't really, we got a sprint that we're working on. We can't really make changes to the system right now, right or wrong. Right? You know, so this is absolutely a true statement that hasn't changed in 40 years, right? Very prescient, I think, the work that she did. So the other thing, this is very much along the lines of what I was talking about, right? Even when we know and we found the flaws in the system, it's not easy to replace it, you know? How many times do we say, I know, I know, I know about that system, it's just don't touch it, please. You know, leave it there, right? Very, very common. Why? The developer left. We don't have the source code, right? I don't have the time, you know, it, you know. And for economic reasons, I like how she called out economic reasons, right? We're running a business, right? We're running an organization where you have only so many people working, right? So many hours in a day. Right? It becomes very, very difficult to replace systems, even if I know they're flawed. And, well, okay, great, so let's do Greenfield. Let's develop new things and we'll develop, develop them perfectly secure. Right, I, I see, <laughs> so don't laugh, you know what I mean? That is a belief, but, but you know, it's not really possible, right? Is it impossible? Mm, I don't know that it's impossible, right? It, it's possible, like, in a sense that people are doing shift left, Right, they're embedding security into the pipeline. Right, they're doing static code analysis. They're doing IAC scanning, right, infrastructure as code scanning. They're doing vulnerability scanning, you know, during the build phase, so you don't push that stuff out to production. Right, you don't deploy that to your clusters. And then when I do deploy it, I, you know, constantly scan it in the runtime. So it is, but it's extremely difficult, right? And again, you know, the economics play into that, right? Uh, I'm all about, you know, sending out new features that are gonna map up to my marketing roadmap and that are ultimately gonna generate income so I can keep everyone employed, right? So these, you can see 40 something years ago and those assumptions are very much still part of our uh, context. And this is a good one too, right? 40 something years ago, even the most secure systems are vulnerable to abuse by insiders who misuse their privileges, right? Zero trust, anyone, right? 40 something years ago, it's still true, right? Still very much true. The system is perfectly, you know, the, the doors are locked, the windows are locked, right? But, um, you know, the people that are inside the house, you know, very common, it can exfiltrate data, you know, you know the deal. So these uh, assumptions that Dorothy did, uh, you know, um, underpin the research and the model, I think are still very much valid for the cloud native paradigm. So quickly looking at a model and, you know, um, this is a generic model, she created this using just statistics, right? And these are some of the components that go into essentially every, mo every um, tool to this day, right? And we're gonna map this out also to cloud native and cloud infrastructure to see how these appear in that context, right? So the six components are subjects, right? Service accounts, human accounts, API keys, right? These are the things that, that are, these are the actors, if you will, right, in that cloud environment, right? Very much still a thing, right? IAM, Active Directory, you know, these are things that are um, very difficult to protect, right? There's, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's whole tools and marketplace for credential, sort of like least privilege, right? Making sure that people are not allowed to overly protect. Don't want to give root pseudo to everybody, right? But sometimes we do, right? So objects, objects are the resources, right? So in the cloud context, these would be EC2s, ELBs, Right, elastic load, you know, load balancers, right, subnets. These would be, uh, you know, in, inside of Kubernetes, it would be the cluster, the, you know, the pod, the container, right? We have to be able to kind of identify those and classify those as objects in the model, right? Audit records, 
Essentially, these are going to be, um, you know, what we're consuming to create that model, right? So, like, how can I know, you know, what is, you know, the standard behavior and what's anomalous? More often than not, I'm reading logs, right? I'm reading CloudTrail, you know, logs from AWS. I'm reading GCP audit logs. I'm reading, you know, Kubernetes audit logs. I'm tapping into uh, Audit D inside a Linux system. Right? I'm tapping into these different resources to build this model. And the model essentially is the profiles. Right? So the profiles will be who's talking to who, right? what's happening in a given time frame. So if you look at um, these resources as nodes in the graph, right? and then the connections between these nodes as essentially you know, edges right, in this graph, you know, that's basically as I I can start building a visual, essentially a logical model of behaviors by looking at what resources are communicating to which resources. Uh, and that creates a profile. You know, it, it, it originally she did that based on a template, but now there's more modern ways to create this prof profile and update the profile, right? Because things change. You know, I mentioned in the beginning that cloud native, you know, velocity and the speed of change is so critical, right? We want to, you know, now people are shipping code on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, bug fixes and features. Uh, records, right? Okay, so I found an anomaly, right? That's going to trigger an event or an alert, right? And it's going to go to different channels depending on where that's going. And uh, activity rules is the idea of, uh, you can use it for a variety of things. One of the things that's commonly used is to produce a report right, to um, trigger some auto remediation, right, I can call, you know, a webhook to address something, right, I, not, I noticed something very unusual and potentially malicious, I made sense of that in my model, I may want to try to communicate to the AWS API and change the security rule to, you know, close a port, right, that may be one thing I want to do. So that's the model, and incredibly, I've, I've worked, you know, I've um, been pretty intimate with um, one of the cutting edge models right now um, with a company called Lacework, and, um, you know, a lot of the stuff is still that way, you know. I, I looked at other vendors as well, did a bunch of research, and a lot of the stuff is still very much done this way, you know. So again, this research has really been influential and, and um, you know, a huge leap forward. So to give an example, a more real world example, you know, I said this talk was gonna be introductory, right? All, all levels. So the idea is think of securing a house, right? Let's compare signature-based protection and anomaly-based detection looking at a house, right? So I wanna protect my house, right? I work with ADT or some other company. I put, um, you know, locks on the doors. I have keychain touchpad maybe for my garage or for my door sometimes. You know, each person in my house, my son has one, my, my wife has one, right? I make sure that all the uh, windows have alert, have alarms, right? That's essentially the, the, the you know, the, the signature-based stuff, right? That's my CIS standard, right? That's my, my, my STIG, right? Where I'm saying, make sure that root is not allowed to log in, you know, you, you know uh, using a password, right? These are all those checkpoints that every house should have, quote unquote, right? Cool, right? But the thing is that, what if someone, you know, uh, my son coming back from school drops the keys on the floor, right? And then someone comes into the house using that, right? Then I will be able to, there's no rules against that. My son is allowed to, to, to come into the house at any time, right? There's not a window. Maybe my gardener can, you know, use the key to open the gate to the backyard, you know, Monday through Friday, you know, 9 a.m. to 10, 10 a.m., right? My son can do it at any time, but I can know my son's behavior, right? He comes home from school, he goes to do his homework, then he goes to play video games, normally he spends time in the, in the you know, living room, et cetera, but then I see that the person that used my son's key came in, went to the master bedroom, and started poking in the drawers in the closet, right? That's unusual, that's an anomaly, right? That's potentially malicious, that's why I'm gonna bring this up. So one of the things that we need to start seeing here is that this needs to be individualized, right? CIS standard, DISA-SIG, 
everybody should be doing these things, right? Everybody who, who's operating on AWS should use the CIS AWS standard, right? But the thing is that each house is different. How my family operates is different than how my neighbor's family operates, right? You know, so for example, you know, maybe my son, you know, goes to the medicine cabinet to get the asthma thing, but, you know, that other person doesn't, the neighbor doesn't. So it's going to be common for my son to be going into the medicine cabinet. But then all of a sudden, I see an eight-year-old child in my neighbor, in, in their house, you going into the medicine cabinet. Why? Why is he going to the medicine cabinet? He's eight years old. He doesn't, you know, you get the point, right? So that's anomaly detection. It's really, it's, it's giving me something beyond these normal detections and these usual standards, right? Um, so pulling this into the cloud arena, right? Let's look at this example here, right? This is essentially a model, right? Essentially a baseline. I said the, the name of the uh, talk is baselines and baseline. I don't know how many people came for the music part or how many people came for the security part. I, I think the security majority of people probably, you know, but, but the, um, so this is a baseline, right? I basically built a logical model of the operations of my cloud, my application, my Kubernetes cluster. Here I have these two accounts, right, connecting to the AWS API through these geographic locations, right? Portland, Oregon, Columbus, Ohio. I have employees there, right? I, I don't know, all of a sudden I'm getting, you know, connections from Japan. Okay, maybe, you know, somebody's on vacation in Japan and they're connecting through the VPN, right? Which, 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 um, you know, which uh, service principles I'm using, right? Which credentials I'm using, right? What are the resources that I'm uh, um, utilizing in which regions, right? Some people don't even have applications in multi-regions, right? Then all of a sudden I'm detecting that people are launching all these stacks on this other region, a crypto miner or whatever, right? So this is a typical model of what it will look like. And these are the nodes and the relationships between the nodes to alert me and advise me and give me insights about my individualized model, right? Prod is gonna be different than QA, than dev, right? So I have to be able to build these models for the different environments where I'm doing compute. So, you know, relating to music, you know, it's not a huge thing, right? But, but it's like, you know, if you look at the baseline, you know, for those of you that like music, you know, it's really sort of the, the glue that kind of glues the whole track together, the song together, right? It's really the bass that's kind of driving that song and then dynamic, along with the rhythm, right? But, you know, I pulled out a quote about groove, right? It's a feel that's created by a repeating framework, but also contains variations, right? That's kind of like us, right? We're creating these applications and these services to serve our businesses and to serve our community, as the case may be, right? And when things are working nicely, everybody's operating, you know, according to that underlying infrastructure, everything is groovy, right? Everything is good. But all of a sudden, if you hit the wrong notes, that can throw the groove out, right? That's the idea of baseline detection and really understanding your services, your applications, your different topologies to you know, bring up better security insights and make you more effective as security professionals. So, you know, good. You know, we know that there is a problem in cloud security. Cloud security is not a solved problem, right? There is a need for new tools and new approaches. Anomaly detection seems like it still would make sense for this cloud native paradigm, right? We get a basic sense of what an anomaly detection model is, right? So what's the benefit, right? I think I touched on that a little bit, but I wanna spell it out a little bit more, right? This is good if you're going back to work tomorrow and you, you sort of like you're, you know, you are a CIO, a CISO, you know, and you're thinking, what tools should I do, you know, should I buy, you know, or what should I develop? What should I focus my, my resources on, right? So I think that anomaly detection brings certain, you know, benefits that are gonna be really critical for cloud security and cloud native security. Right, um, and it's not an area that there's a lot of um, discussion about yet, right? I, there's some vendors that are doing it really well. I saw Abnormal here today. Sentinel One is doing it as well. You know, there's some really good companies that are starting to do that and it can really change the equation here for us. 
So anomaly detection I mentioned, insider, insider threats, right? Masquerade attacks, zero day attacks, right? Th these are things that because I'm looking at the behavior and the topology of applications, I'll be able to catch those. And the thing that I think is really interesting as well is if I look at a malicious actor, if I have an anomaly detection, well, you know, a good one in that cloud environment, it makes it, it's quite a barrier, right? Because I can, you know, kind of look at the CIS, you know, sort of standard. I can look at my STIG, you know, hardening on my servers and stuff like that. And I kind of know the landscape and I kind of know that like this attack more than likely will be successful, right? Now, the thing is, um, if I don't know what I'm expecting, right, because I don't know what's, you know, what's going to be detected as an anomaly in this environment that I'm operating, right, I don't know what's the typical behavior and what's going to be alerted, that can be really powerful, right. The other thing that anomaly detection is doing when it's implemented correctly is kind of move us away from that sort of, you know, huge backlog of false positives, like that needle in a haystack. I get so many alerts, how many are actually relevant, right? Because I'm actually alerting you th on things that are not part of your architecture, not part of your normal operating behavior, I'm getting less alerts and I'm getting more objective, you know, and actionable alerts. The other thing too is alert storms, right? Alert storms are a, a huge bane in sort of like uh, the cloud security, cloud native space, why? Immutable infrastructure, right? Infrastructure is code. I have a lot of the same. I have a lot of resources that are identical, or at least I want to, right? That's the whole idea, you know, the pet, pets and cattle, the whole thing, right? I have a bunch of identical resources. Now a flaw or a rule gets triggered, I get 14 alerts, right? My JIRA, <laughs> you know, that happens a lot, you know, and it can be a real distraction, right? And it can really, kind of pull the steam off, you know, take the steam off my alerting framework, right? So because I'm building that logical model in cloud, I know that, you know, these 14 nodes are a cluster, right? They are Kubernetes cluster. I know that all of these containers are a pod, right? That's the idea, right? These are part of all one auto-scaling group. So if there is something unusual about them, send me one alert. Right, that's the idea here. So to kind of move away from the alert storms. Um, so, you know, okay, Andre, if it's so good and it can help me so much, is it perfect? Has it been challenged? Yes, it has been challenged, right? I was talking about how much uh, Denon's um, research has been influential and survived decades, right? Still influential today. But there's been challenges to the model from a conceptual framework, right? Conceptual um, viewpoint, if you will. There is a, a famous paper, you know, a sort of um, very widely cited paper by Gates and Taylor, 2009, where um, they challenged the anomaly detection paradigm by saying anomaly detection assumes that attacks are anomalous or different than the norm, right? Is that always true? Maybe, maybe not, right? I think the previous speaker um, was talking about how people, you know, and this is, happens a lot in network security where people will hide the payload on the normal channel. Like, so my, my, my server is a web server that receives traffic on port 80, right? Um, and then the, they hide their tracks, right? They'll put like a malicious packet or other types of payloads. It could be different things. It could be, uh, you know, messages on a queue or, or like a batch transfer that I'm doing, right? Where it is a normal behavior, but that attack was disguised because it wasn't unusual. It's what that system does normally, right? So attacks are rare. That's not always true, um, right? Uh, you know, so, you know, have you ever opened a SSH server to the DMZ or put it in your house? What happens almost immediately, right? logins, people trying to brute force your SSH server, right? So that would be hard to detect because these attacks are very common. It's happening all the time, right? And the other thing is anomalous activity is malicious. That's a base of Denning's model, right? Is that always true? No, right? It's not always true. Applications, especially now cloud native, right? We're trying to focus on sort of the cloud security space and cloud native. Is this true? 
No, because there's tremendous experimentation, right? There's tremendous you know, velocity of development where people are using new APIs, they're trying to use new server, new services all the time and make modifications to the services, right? So there are some challenges to the anomaly detection model and that's why we want those layers, right, where you still have the traditional security. Um, so a couple of quick practi practical challenges. So, you know, I was asking myself this question, right? So, if, you know, anomaly detect, this is so cool, right? How come this is not, how come I haven't heard of this before, right? Uh, how come every tool doesn't have this, right? Because it hasn't been easy in the past, in the 90s and even in the 2000s, right? Because you gotta analyze all of that data, all of those things, all of those signals, all those data points fast enough, right, to create a model, right? And, and, and that's been computationally very difficult in the past, right? You know, I have a bank, I have thousands and thousands of servers and everybody's talking to everybody, right? Okay, you know, like what kind of system do I need to analyze that? In the past, it was almost impossible. These systems need to be fast enough and they need to be scalable enough for the challenge of the cloud scale, right? You know, there's, you know I think this um, speaks for itself. Streaming data, right? This is almost requires an online analysis, right? Because everything, you know, um, things are, are moving at the speed of cloud, right? So these things need to be fast enough. These models need to be fast enough to do that. And, you know, that's been a problem with machine learning and data science for a long time, right? Like a sort of a fundamental problem that as the data set grow, the dimensions of that problem grow and it's harder for you to find the data points that are relevant within the, 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 the haystack gets so much bigger, it's harder to find the needle, right? So that's been a, a, a barrier before. Um, the other thing is that rich domain knowledge is needed, right? I can build a logical model, right? But how am I gonna know what's actually relevant so I can surface those alerts, right? Great data scientists are a must have, but you also have to have a great security team to make sense of that data in the tool, right, as you're creating a platform like this, right? You need to have, um, you know, a great uh, world-class sort of security team that can map those data dimensions to actual security insights, right? And, and that, you know, hasn't, it, it's not easy, right? For example, there are so many new APIs and services all the time and their behaviors are changing all the time. Amazon reinvent, I don't know, 200 services every year, right? This is all stuff that needs to be processed and kind of taken into consideration on the model. Um, talked about development velocity, right? Things are moving very fast. Um, auto scaling continues to be a problem. This is all makes it very difficult for anomaly detection, intrusion detection to be effective. Uh, one last thing on this is disparate data sources, right? We have um, so many sources of data, we have point tools. Right? I have some tools that are scanning my code, I have a different tool that's doing my pipeline, I have a different tool that's doing static analysis, something else for cloud, I have inspector here, but on Azure I have this other thing, right? For me to gather all that data into the anomaly detection model is extremely difficult because there's so many silos of information, right? So, so that's been um, you know, difficult in the past. So what you really need is a platform, right, that can either concatenate and correlate all that data or sort of tool consolidation is something that's considered in this arena as well. Um, finally, you know, one of the big challenges for, um, and I think I'm doing good on time, I can slow down a little bit, right? 10 minutes. Maybe we'll have time for questions. Um, so, you know, what about, um, you know, malicious actors that are trying to attack your anomaly detection uh, platform or, you know, effort, right? That does happen, right? So I was, you know, as I was doing this research, I, I found some, some really good stuff where people are saying, here's how you exploit anomaly detection systems, right? So I, I picked out a couple of things that I think might be relevant for the cloud um, framework, right? One of them is target recon, right? Like uh, casing the joint, right, as they say. You know, we talked about um, insider threat, right? 
So, you know, and we talked about how anomaly detection can make the, the ground a little unknown to, to a malicious actor, right? But potentially an inside, um, inside actor could tell you what's usual, what's unusual about that environment, right? And then can help you kind of develop attacks and vectors that are not that out of the ordinary for that particular institution or organization, right? The other way that um, anomaly detection systems can be attacked is by generating noise. You know, you start to create a lot of anomalies, right, in various ways. You know, if you are able to do that, then, you know, that system is gonna generate too much, too much noise and, um, you know, it's gonna be harder for that analyst to really make sense of that anomaly or surface that an anomaly with, um, with the correct severity, right, with the correct, um, you know, urgency. And we talked a little bit about covert channels where there are, you know, um, you know, malicious actors are trying to figure out ways where essentially you, you know, hide your tracks and kind of come in through non-anomalous ways. Um, so, you know, at this point you may be losing hope, right? It's like, okay, that stuff is really promising. You know, it looks like it can help cloud security, but there's all these challenges and all these difficulties, you know, so, this is never gonna be more than a niche thing in our industry, right? It's not really gonna be the thing. Uh, but I think that there's good news, you know, and I wanted to bring this up a little bit, right? One of the things that's really driving the um, state of the art of anomaly detection, intrusion detection, has been the idea of unsupervised machine learning, right? If you look at Denning's or original model, it was just statistics, right? I would say the typical user doesn't access more than 100 files on a given day. This guy is accessing 1,000 files, you know? Models have become more, more um, dynamic and more, um, you know, sophisticated, where you do machine learning and you don't necessarily need to set that threshold. I look at what Joe does, you know, on a typical day, you know? I look at what that application does on a typical day or typical month and then I give you the model based on what I'm observing, right? The thing with that is that, you know, machine learning normally relies on essentially you tagging that data, right? You, what is normal? This is normal, this is normal, this is not normal. You know, so unsupervised machine learning, the advances in data science allow you to basically detect behavior and create those baselines without any human intervention. Right, so from the point of view of cloud security, you just provide your AWS API, your cloud trail, you know, your, your you know, install an agent on the servers and you collect that data and the, the system will generate that model for you, right, faster. You know, so that's really, you know, driving, you know, advances on the state of the art here. The other thing has been the scale and speed, right? So, you know, I mentioned that one of the challenges of anomaly detection is the speed and the scale of cloud, but that also, also works in our favor, right? Because we can build more scalable solutions in cloud, right? We can build um, architectures in cloud that are essentially infinitely scalable, right? And, you know, using certain techniques, you know, in architectures, we can make this stuff really fast as well. So, you know, I put a couple of questions here that we may want to ask um, as, as if you are evaluating vendors that have in their marketing brochure, I do anomaly detection, right? How scalable is really this tool, right? How many resources can you analyze, right? Some people will tell you 10,000 resources, right? Mm, you know, you probably have more than 10,000 cloud resources in a typical organization. Right, so make sure that as you're evaluating anomaly detection platforms, that they can scale scale to the size of your environment. Right, so that, but 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 yeah, that's something that's been a positive. That there are companies that are doing that, and they're doing that very well today. You know, I was talking to the folks at an uh, abnormal, and and once they build that model, they're able to evaluate an email in 0 0.7 seconds, you know, it's, it's pretty impressive, all as a software as a service. Um, better, research, better data science is available today, right? There's been huge advances in the, in the science of, of this, right, of unsupervised machine learning. If you are interested in this stuff, if you are someone that has, um, you know, um, that inclination, you can look at stuff like isolation forest, right, uh, local outlier, 
you know, all of this stuff really makes the ability to detect those anomalies consuming a lot less memory and a lot, a lot faster, right? Again, lending to that scale and speed that's necessary to create viable solutions here. So, you know, the scale is better, the speed is better, the data models are better. Um, and I think I'm closing, I'm gonna start closing this up. So, you know, what's the future of anomaly detection, right, and how it plays into um, cloud security? So, you know, that's the good news. There are better tools, right? So if you looked at this in the past, you know, like you looked at um, some tools like 10 years ago, even five years ago, even a couple of years ago, and you, yeah, I tested it, I POC did, it didn't really do what I needed it to do. I would encourage you to kind of take a fresh look at it, talk to your friendly local, you know, um, engineering head or solution architect at some of these top, you know, anomaly detection companies, and you may be surprised. It may be something that can add a lot of benefits to your cloud security portfolio. So the second thing that I'm, I'm really looking forward to that, you know, I hope is gonna be the evolution of uh, anomaly detection platforms is the idea of combining signature base with anomaly detection in the same platform, right? That can be really, really powerful. So you are taking, you are doing compliance, you are doing vulnerability management, but you're also doing anomaly detection, right, into one cohesive, better tool, right? We, I hope we're gonna see more of that whether, you know, but if, if done correctly, right? The, talked about the better data models, get into that, it's definitely worth taking a look at it and I think, you, you know, just for your own knowledge, understand how some of these things are, are, are being created. It's something that it's very, very impressive. The other thing that's very, very important is it, that it's not done super well yet from the research that I did is correlation of the signature based with the anomaly detection. That can be really, really powerful, right? Uh, so for example, I can say, I have these vulnerabilities, this system is only partially compliant with our hardening standard, and I'm observing this behavior, right, into one signal and one alert, right? That can be really, really powerful. That can really um, reduce those false positives, bring other things that will be difficult to, to arise. The other thing too that's important that a lot of the models are not doing yet from my research is correlating multiple events, right? I think a lot of the platforms that I you know, research preparing for this, will be, they'll be able to tell you one anomaly, right? This individual anomalous action, right? Um, you know, but not necessarily to say, there's a bunch of things that are mildly suspicious, but then putting all of those together here is something that deserves investigation, right? That's something that needs more work. And that's the last thing I'm gonna say is that um, R&D is needed, right? This is not necessarily, you know, we need to continue to evolve these platforms, but it costs a lot of money because as I mentioned, you need a world-class data science team and you need um, a world-class security team. You need people that know how to scale these services in various clouds, right? This is all expensive, you know. So what's been happening in our industry that's been great is all the startup innovation and the VC cash, right? That's, you know, some folks have been able to get huge piles of cash to build that R&D, right? Current economic conditions, you know, may or may not change this in the future, right? So I would welcome and love to see more R&D happening in there, and I hope that that continues to take place into uh, our industry. The last thing that I'm gonna say is get into the groove, quote unquote, right? This is worth your time to investigate, is worth taking a look at that. Try to bring this into your security portfolio. I think that we're all gonna be better off for that. Thank you, any questions if we have time? 50 seconds, <laughs> that's it. Thank you, RVA.